Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our presentation on food sensitivities and food allergies. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot going on in the world of food allergies and sensitivities in, in our world right now. There's a lot of miscommunication. There's a, there's a lot of information that, um, that, that is inaccurate. And uh, the purpose of the webinar today was really to create some clarity. Um, in my practice, we see a lot of we see a lot of chronic illness. So I'm practicing in natural medicine all the time. And, and what, we're, what we see is a lot of immune irritation, I guess, to summarize. So there's massive amounts of immune irritation. And, uh, and we're always using natural strategies. So the two, the two pieces that, that we use in our office is where we're using uh, advanced diagnostic testing. That's, that's a big part of what we do. And we're using natural strategies to, um, to correct the problem. So, oh, I was fighting with this self. I think I finally got a, a decent our, our image. So, so that's what we're seeing in our clinic. We're using advanced diagnostic testing and we're, we're using some natural, some kind of natural strategies to correct it. So I get a lot of people that come into the office and, and they're, they're, they're looking for food sensitivity tests because they're looking for the magical, the magical fix and, and food sensitivity, sensitivity testing is very powerful but there's a lot of confusion around it. And again, people are spending a lot of money on tests that are absolutely garbage. So I'm gonna create some clarity there. And, um, and they don't really know how the test works. So some laboratory tests with regards to food sensitivities, now people are losing, I don't know, confidence in them. And because a lot of these tests are, everything is elevated and everybody's frustrated because it can't be true or, or sometimes it's not showing anything and people have symptoms and they remove the food, but there's, there's still some problems. So I'm gonna create some clarity. There's only me here. Sometimes I have two people, so I have another person to monitor so that people can ask questions. I'm not gonna be able to do that today. We should wrap up in about probably 30, 40 minutes, I think, depending on how much I ramble here. But uh, with that being said, you can, you can email me any questions that you have about this, because um, I know a lot of people are looking for answers. So I want to create some clarity, and I also want to be able to reference this video in the future for maybe my patients so they can understand how food sensitivity tests work. So um, let's see if I can properly share my screen here. Um, there we are. So food sensitivity tests, um, are they accurate? Well, this is a big, 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 big question. They are, they aren't, and everything in between. Um, so that's what we're gonna answer today. Um, very important. So food, food sensitivity and food allergy tests and food reactivity tests, they're actually all different. You could break them up into two categories. So if someone goes to their medical doctor and they think they're eating something and they have this massive skin disorder that erupts immediately, or their throat swells up, something like that, we could be very confident that that is a true medical allergy. So that's highly reactive, highly, highly reactive. Um, a lot of foods cause problems that they're nowhere near that level of reactivity. They're actually, um, they're actually the result of, um, they're actually the result of a sensitivity um, or a reactivity. So not an allergy, a sensitivity or reactivity. And those things, if they go on long enough, they can create a lot of havoc in the body. So you wanna catch those. So we're gonna be talking mostly about reactivities and sensitivities because they, they, they can build up to a true allergy where your throat swells up and everything. And, and true medical allergies, most people know if they're consuming something. Again, it's an immediate response and it can be, it can be pretty significant. Um, so if you consume a food that is triggering an immune response, you are poisoning your body. That is why this is important. It's, your body doesn't see it anything different than a poison. And if you poison your body, your body starts reacting, it, it consumes resources, it literally destroys your tissues. Premature aging as well. Many chronic symptoms are a result of immune irritation and most common immune irritations are foods. So this is important. And, and doing it the right way is really, really important. And I, a lot of, you know, a lot, you know, I'm saying a lot of patients don't understand this or a lot of individuals don't understand this, what we're going to talk about today, but there's a lot of clinicians. There's a lot of clinicians that don't, don't understand what we're going to talk about here today. So I think it's very, very important. 
So not all tests are created equal. equal. And this is a, this is a journal, uh, allergy journal, and we're looking at leukocyte uh, food allergy tests. So this is a family of food sensitivity tests, food allergy tests, cytotoxic food tests, and sublingual provocative food tests are both unreliable for diagnosis of food allergy. So there, this cytotoxic food tests have been around a long time. And in many realms, it's seen as a gold standard. So if you, you are sitting at home and you're watching this and maybe you're looking through your food allergy tests, if you have them, you look for leukocyte food allergy tests. I'll get more into what this is if you don't know what this is, but you want to stay away from this. These big journals are, are, really, are really picking on them. And this is a long time ago. Um, cytotoxic food tests. Uh, you know, again, they're saying that it claims that the test correlated with other reactions of foods, headaches, diarrhea, fatigue are, are, not, are not accurate. So I'm, I'm going through a few of these different common tests because people have to know what is accurate, what isn't accurate. And this is pulled from scientific journals, like, like significant journals. So th this isn't just an opinion, by no means, by no means. Um, this is a, a kind of a crazy one because um, cytotoxic tests, food allergy tests, um, actually have been not authorized by the FDA. Now, the FDA is the regulatory board of what is effective, what is accurate, what isn't accurate. And they dismissed, um, they dismissed this family of tests. And this is a big family of food allergy tests. So this, is, this was actually their notice. Um, and then this is a bit of a summary. FDA has determined that cytotoxic tests remain, as of 1985, as an unproven diagnostic procedure unsupported by scientific literature or well-controlled studies and clinical trials. This is a big deal and this is old, but these tests are still out there, okay? So there's been a lot of labs, laboratory tests, not only looking at food allergy tests over the, uh, that have been shut down because of, of clinical procedures. Even though the FDA didn't totally agree with them, they've actually had other problems on top of it. So. Food sensitivity and food allergy tests, we have the science, we just have to use the right science. If we use the right science, we can figure some of this stuff out. We can figure out, uh, figure out a lot of root causes of, of health conditions, but it has to be done right. And, uh, and, and, then, it, and then if you get false positive tests, well, it's, it's really heart-wrenching because if, if, you do a false, if you do a test and there's a bunch of false positives and you avoid all these foods, and food is such a social component of life, and you avoid all these foods because this test is telling you to, but it's not accurate, you're not feeling any better, it just creates all this confusion and people are still looking for answers. It starts with accurate testing. And believe me, in clinic years ago, I did a lot of bad tests. I didn't understand all this. Now we've got it dialed in a lot more. Probably in 20 years, we'll learn a lot more again. Um, this is just another journal from the commission on, on the dietetic commission. And they, they were saying the same thing. Cytotoxic T tests and MRT tests are not very accurate. Okay, so we got to be careful what's out there. So here's a little bit of a summary of this. I got this from a colleague of mine. There's two families of tests. You see on the left, cytotoxic, toxic teat, cytotoxic tests. They incorporate some, some common laboratory tests that you may have seen. The MRT, that test has been around for a long, long time. And you'll see that on your labs, actually. If you, you might see MRT in big bold letters on the top of the lab. ALCAT, ALCAT is being a standard in a lot of the medical world for a long, long time. This falls under cytotoxic testing. And LR, LRA, I have still used LRA in some situations because some tests, the only thing you can do is LRA. We know it's not that accurate. It's better than nothing. But if we don't have a test out there that is an LRA, out of all three of these, I'd be more confident with LRA. But it's not, it's not that accurate. You can see... Um, there's even states, many states have banned this test, this family of tests. Okay, so be careful with this. And if you can't rep reproduce the results of a test, it's not accurate. And, uh, and this is serious stuff. We need to know if there's a food acting as a poison in our body. On the other hand, there's a family of tests called immunoglobulin testing. And in the world we live in right now, with the whole virus piece and all of that, we are hearing a lot about immunoglobulins. Well, at least I am, or I'm paying attention to it or listening to it. And that, that is uh, antibody test. So um, these antibody tests are, um, are, are reproducible. 
there's different forms of antibodies. There's, these are immunoglobulins, IgG, IgM, and IgA. These are all immunoglobulins, different forms of immunoglo immunoglobulins are used for testing different things. I'll get more into this here. This is the family of tests you really want to look at. You want to stay away from the cytotoxic testing. You can reproduce these results of, of, the, of the antibody or the immunoglobulin test. And, um, and, and they're so accurate that you can actually look at something called cross-reactivity. So if any of you listening to this that I've worked with, you'll, understand, you'll know what cross-reactive foods are. But to give a bit of a snapshot, um, if your body reacts to say this food, and I like to use the example of gluten because gluten is a big deal for many people. If your body reacts to this food, maybe I have some props here. Um, I do. If you can see, if this is a shape of a protein that your body doesn't like, of course, it's a red pen, but our body determines what's good or bad by, its, by the three-dimensional structure. So if your body doesn't like this pen, the shape of this food, that's this pen, Say this is gluten, but you expose, but there, but you expose yourself to this food. This is a black marker, <laughs> and say this is a a food that looks a little bit for for the purposes of my explanation. Imagine this black pen, this black marker looks like this red pen. It kind of does, somewhat of the shape. This is the way your immune system determines if it doesn't like something by its shape. And if it doesn't like, for the example, I'm using gluten. Introduce a food that looks a lot like it and you will have cross reactivity. If your body didn't like gluten, you introduce this other food and, and you can have the same response, the same allergy, the same sensitivity as gluten gave it. On my website, I talk all about cross reactive foods. There's a panel you can do. I order it a lot that is on cross reactive foods. So a lot of people can remove foods like gluten and they feel pretty good. But they're still not quite right. And then we find out there's all these other foods that are acting like gluten to the body and your body's having a similar response. So with cytotoxic testing, you can never get accurate enough results to see if there's cross-reactive foods. You can't do it, but you can do it with antibody testing. So it's clinically useful for identi identifying cross-reactive foods. Okay. So very important, stick with your antibody test. That's, um, that's the gold standard. Okay, and there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Microassay is not that good. ELISA is it tends to be the best, but mostly we don't see too much microassay anymore. So, antibodies, uh, ELISA, and just first work on you know, get your antibody test. That's always the best. So when a good test becomes inaccurate, so what I wanted to do is to talk about today is not just so much of okay, this is a company that's better, that's a company that's not as good. Um, and there are some that are better than others, but if you do the antibody testing, the immunoglobulin testing, you'll probably be the best. I'll give you some examples of what that looks like or what those tests look like, but you can do a good test, but it can still be a problem. And this is a big, big deal, a very big deal. So there's a few reasons. So when a, when a good test, be, say even you're doing an immunoglobulin test, but it becomes inaccurate, well, um, one scenario is where everything is negative, meaning you have false negatives, meaning you, you do this great big fancy food sensitivity, food allergy panel, whatever we want to call it, and, um, and everything is showing in the green. Green is good, but you still have symptoms. Well, there's reasons for this. So if everything is negative, sometimes it's because you have a weak immune system. And if you, so these foods, these food sensitivity panels, like immunoglobulin testing, you're testing to see if your body is making antibodies or immunoglobulins for that food. If, if you consume the food, well, you should consume the food. There's another scenario of, uh, of being false negative. So if you're, for example, if you're, I'm using gluten again, if you're testing for gluten, but you don't consume gluten, you know, a week before the test, your body's not going to build antibodies for gluten and you're measuring the antibodies or you're measuring the immunoglobulins. So you gotta get exposure and see if your immune system ramps up for that specific food. So one reason why you could have false negatives if you're not consuming the food, you're not getting exposure to the food. When I'm working with patients, we always want them to get some exposure to those antigens or to those foods within a week prior to the test. That's one reason, if you don't, that's one reason you could have false negatives. Most doctors will give you the right information on that. 
The second reason, if you have a weak immune system, so if you can't mount an immune response, this happens. This happens if you can't make enough immunoglobulins because you're testing immunoglobulins produced to that food. And if you can't make any immunoglobulins, naturally you can't make immunoglobulins to that food. So weak immune system and an inability to produce IgGs, IgAs, RGMs. These are different types of immunoglobulins. An, a major reason why you can have an immune, immune problem or a weak immune system is if you are on any steroids or immunosuppressants, it could be over the counter or it could be prescribed. Now, when, you know, what, what I used to do before uh, immune sensitivity testing, or I should say food allergies or any of these things, I would, you know, ask my patients, did you consume any corticosteroids or immunosuppressants or even antihistamines, you know, within, you know, two months prior to today? Well, we deal with a lot of sick people on a lot of medications. We could, many people were on these medications. So, Instead of just you know, not doing the test, now we're doing an immunoglobulin test. So we're testing to see if they can make immunoglobulins regardless, is, and if they can do that, we can be comfortable enough that they're making enough of an immune response so we can further do the test. So, there's, so you don't wanna just do a food sensitivity test and spend all this money on these things. You wanna make sure you can make an immune response doing an immunoglobulin test before doing food sensitivity test. Many people can be on immunosuppressants and steroids and still make enough immunoglobulins, but you don't want to take the chance. You want to, and now I do it on everybody. I don't, I don't just, just screen people if they're on immunosuppressants or cortical steroids because those things suppress immune systems and suppress immunoglobulin production. We'll do the immunoglobulin test on everybody because it's relatively cheap. It's very cheap and uh, it saves us in the long run. So a few reasons why you could have false negatives and it, it might not, your test might not be showing where, where there is a problem if there's a food problem is again, not no exposure to the food that's being tested or the foods being tested and a weak system mostly due to, some people just have a you know, very weak immune system or medications as well, steroids. So the other side of the spectrum is when you end up with false positives. Now, I get this all the time where people don't lose confidence in food sensitivity tests when they come in and they bring all their, all their, all their testing in. They say, I don't know if this is accurate. Well, sometimes it can be a crappy lab. We establish that. Like, and it, sometimes it can be an a improper test where, where the test is um, more cytotoxic tests. As you can see, those are, are inaccurate. And even there's major regulatory boards like the FDA don't approve of them. Um, but if you have everything positive, well, that can mean a few things. One, maybe if you're listening to this, you've probably heard of the phrase leaky gut. Okay, so leaky gut is a common culprit in everything being you know, false positives. And you're, when you eat food, it should stay contained in your digestive tract. Okay, it should stay contained. Like if my tie, if you can see some of my tie, it should stay contained, your food. And outside the tie is something called the 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 bloodstream. So you could have a permeability or tears between holes between your gut and your blood barrier. So proteins cross your gut blood barrier and where they should stay in your gut, they drift in your bloodstream and they mount an immune response because remember that's a foreign, pro, a foreign entity in your bloodstream. And that's where your immune system is. And you're, you, you can have a, a artificial immune response allergy to a food that isn't even an allergy. It's only an allergy because there's a hole and there's holes in your, in your, in your, in your intestinal blood barrier. Okay. So you can fix that. Uh, so you want to rule out leaky gut or be very confident. People with leaky gut usually have significant digestive distress. Uh, people with leaky gut will have constipation. That means not having a bowel movement every day. Sometimes people have a few days without a bowel movement. Or if they have diarrhea, intermittent diarrhea throughout the week any of those situations would be pretty confident there's got to be some component of leaky gut and that can create false positives. Now foods can create leaky gut as well. There's another one and this is way beyond the scope of what we have time to talk about. Polyreactive antibodies. Uh, this is extremely complicated, very rare. I've had only a few in my career. Maybe I had one this year, I think. Uh, it's where people have immune systems that um, how can I make this simple? They have, a, they have antibodies that want to at, at, attack everything. 
This doesn't mean they're a sick individual. This doesn't even mean they have autoimmunity. They have antibodies. They're building antibodies for everything. They have an antibody, an immunoglobulin that can fit any kind of food. So when we do a test, it's looking like you're making antibodies for everything, but you really aren't. Um, there's reasons for this. You know, this is complicated. If you have questions or if you've been diagnosed with polyreactive antibodies, uh, or if you have a lab panel, a good indication you have polyreactive antibodies if you have a good lab, an immunoglobulin lab, uh, and an antibody lab, and everything is positive, like 99% of everything on your panel is positive, polyreactive antibodies. So, and, and hopefully, the, we're still learning about polyreactive antibodies. That's brand new immunology stuff. I find it really exciting and interesting because it changes things, but... Um, Maybe it's beyond the scope of our talk here today. So here's an example of a great food sensitivity panel. And I'll be very clear with you. I use lots of Cyrex, so I might be biased, Cyrex Laboratories. They do not endorse me, and I do not get anything from them. <laughs> okay, Maybe I should because I'm always talking about them because they're, so, they're such a good company. Um, but you know, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> Um, so here's a food sensitivity panel. It is very, very, very comprehensive. I, I've never seen a company that to build a panel like this yet. It's all immunoglobulins. <clears throat> what it does, this company, um, this one, one of their panels, they do many, they're all about immunology. This panel measures cooked and uncooked foods. So remember foods could be a friend or a foe depending on the shape of the food, if your body recognizes something are good or bad, the shape of the food plays a role into this. So when you cook a food, you can actually alter the protein structure, the shape of it, and then your body might not like it. So it's, it's not a rule of thumb that, you know, uncooked foods we have less reactions to and cooked foods or, or cooked foods, it's not necessarily that simple. Uh, we like to think uncooked foods we'd have less reactions to, but I see all the time where people might react to one form of food versus another. Cyrex is the only company that I've seen as of yet that looks at foods that are altered. These foods you'll see cooked versus uncooked. So right at the top of here, you'll see dairy and eggs modified. Egg white cooked versus, you know, egg yolk cooked. Again, it is really dying, dialing into what could be an immune, creating an immune response for you and an allergy or sensitivity. Um, so that's one thing about this panel. This is actually called Cyrex Array 10. I think you can order right off our website now. I'll, I'll get into that more. Um, but here's an example of a normal, uh, accurate food sensitivity panel. There's no leaky gut, there's no polyreactive antibodies, and there's no immunosuppression. Okay, you know, everybody, of course, is going to be different. But you can see there's someone, this food's out of range, and there's one in the equivocal range. Equivocal really means is um, it, it could be interpreted differently. If you calm the immune system down with lifestyle effects and, and, and dietary and everything else, you can get equivocal foods to move to the green. Once it's in the red, it's always going to be in the red. And if you see something in the red on the Cyrex panel, you take it seriously because it's accurate. Cyrex is the only company, again, they should be paying me for talking about them, but Cyrex is the only company that I know of, there could be others, but I haven't, I haven't heard of them, that will take a food allergy or food sensitivity panel and they will take your blood and test it twice. They want exact same numbers from one panel to another. If they don't have the same panels, they call me, they call the doctor and say, hey, we need another blood sample. So you're actually getting two tests. Uh, that's how accurate these, these guys are. So you can see there's you know, a couple outliers here, none on this sheet. This is a very comprehensive panel. There's a few here, none on this sheet, um, none here, a little bit there, and then this. And it's even looking at gums because some people can have a food allergies to all these different things. So this is what you would call relatively an accurate food sensitivity panel. There's still some immune response. So we know that you know, there's a, you're making an immune response and it's not all lit up where you don't have a whole crazy am amount of positives. So we can say this, is, this isn't leaky gut and you're, it, this, is a, this is an accurate panel. But here's an example of leaky gut. <laughs> there's quite a bit. Okay, this page might still be normal. And we don't have any clinical presentation. I'm not giving an example of what this human would be like, uh, this patient. There's quite a bit here as well. I mean, this is pretty intense. Wow, this is sky high. 
how could somebody be reacting to this much food? And here, still reacting. And here, and here, and here. So this would be an example of, wow, that's way too many foods for someone to have that much reactivity to. This is probably leaky gut. So if this is you, if this is you, because I get a lot of this in my office, people bringing these panels, they're all lit up. If this is you and it is a good lab company and it's a good lab test immunoglobulin test, I would say, hmm, that's leaky gut. So does that mean you avoid all these foods? No, no, probably not. Um, some of those foods, so it's kind of inaccurate. Remember, you have holes in your intestine, you're funneling proteins through to your bloodstream. It's an artificial elevation. There's lots of false positives on here. And then we don't know what food you have to avoid, if any. So what do we do? Well, we want to rule out leaky gut before we even do these tests. And I'll get into that. So how do we also, leaky gut's also known as intestinal permeability. So, um, the best way to rule out leaky gut, if you're working with a doctor, they can kind of dial it in and then maybe you won't have to do a test like this. Um, but if you have a lot of digestive symptoms, some of the, what I mentioned, you wouldn't just want to go do and spend a bunch of money on a big panel like that. This is off my website. You can order this leaky gut test right off. It's blood. It's right off my website. You can maybe find it elsewhere. I don't know. Other doctors, some other doctors will provide it as well, but then you have to go through them. You can actually order directly. You don't even need. Um, it's called Array 2, and it's testing these uh, analytes on the bottom here to rule in or rule out leaky gut. If everything is good, that means your barrier is intact in your intestine, then feel free. Go crazy and you know order all the food sensitivity tests you want or immunoglobulin tests. So rule it out with Array 2. Um, uh, Mechanisms for leaky gut are vast. So don't underestimate leaky gut and, and what can contribute to it. It's not just a food. And it sure as heck isn't just gluten. But you can see diet factors, dietary factors, alcohol, gluten, well, gluten, casein, that's a, that's a dairy protein, processed foods, sugars, fast foods, medications. Every day, all day, medications can create leaky gut. Infections. A lot of times, intestinal infections are the result of leaky gut. Because when you lose, you, when you can't seal up your gut from your bloodstream, that's where infections come through. Stressors, every day, all day. Hormonal disorders, certain hormones need to be elevated and, and we can't have uh, low hormones. I, just today, there was a, uh, an individual, what was today? I don't know. They had significantly low thyroid function. And um, well, I've had a few of them, I guess, this week already. And, and, and they had, everything was proven that there was leaky gut. Well, we're trying to find the mechanism of leaky gut. The thyroid was on the table. You know? um, trauma too, brain trauma. I get a lot of people, a lot of research is showing within five to, five to 15 minutes, brain trauma, concussion. Leaky gut will show itself within five to 15 minutes after a concussion crazy stuff. There's mechanisms for this. I can't explain it today, but um, strokes, um, all sorts of different things and autoimmune disorders. So lots of causes of leaky gut. If you feel you have digestive symptoms and, and something to know, research shows that only 40% of people with leaky gut have symptoms. It's kind of frightening. That's why it's dangerous. Um, uh, hopefully you're the individual that has symptoms, uh, you know, some kind of digestive symptoms. Myself, I know, <laughs> I know when there's a problem. Um, so, how do you prepare for your test? Well, you know, to make sure it's going to be accurate before you uh, end up with false positives or false negatives. Um, the first thing I recommend is test your immunoglobulins, right? Even if you're on steroids, or immunosuppressants, any of that, or even if you're not, test before you do this because it's relatively cheap. Test immunoglobulins. Um, yeah, again, you can order right off my website. I put all this stuff on my website for patients or people kicking tires and wanting answers. They shouldn't need a doctor. Okay, you can get it off the site. And call us if you can't navigate because there's so much on the website. I'll try to show you at the end. Uh, so you can test. Look at this one. It's called over, um, I, it, CFM immunoglobulin panel. That's what we're calling it, CFM, but it's an immunoglobulin panel. It's testing IgAs, GEGs, GMs, GEs. Okay. So you can do that, do that before the test. Um, I guess we're at the end of here already. This is, if you have any questions, I'm gonna show you the website so you can navigate. There's a bunch of free content on there. Um, 
www.drgharrison.com. There's a mountain of information. Call us if there's questions. Um, also, I am going to, if I can, um, if I can do it right now, let me see if it opens through this. Uh, yeah, it is. So it's opening. So there is, um, this is our website. And I'm going to try to navigate around it for you for a little bit. And I, I believe you can see my cursor. So there's a lot of stuff here. There's information. It's all free. Free health workshops. These are all um, recorded video, one-hour workshops. I talk about a multitude of things. Um, there's um, well, lots of videos I did on everything. There's over 150 videos on our YouTube channel on all of this stuff and many, many more. There's a podcast I have with a colleague of mine. Uh, brainstorming with the docs. We talk about many things on the podcast. Um, there over here is where you want to go if you're going to look for labs because we're talking about labs here today. For, uh, free resources, lab testing, store, and education. This is where you're going to want to go if you're looking for labs. This is where you'll get into, um, into many, many things. You'll get into, um, you'll get into all of Oh, that's what we have here. You'll get, oh, the website isn't showing up. <laughs> Thank you for that. I am going to try that again. Uh, let's see if we are here. Um, there we are. Hopefully, we're able to see it now. Okay. Hopefully, we can see that now. So, this is, this is the, this is the front page here. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, this is the front page here. So this is where you can get into everything. And and again, there's lots I mentioned. You know, there's there's workshops, one hour workshops, there's videos, there's there's podcasts down below. We have, I think we have 45 released already. A colleague in mind, we talk about many different things. It's all free. Free resources here. This is the workshops. Um, there's lots on this page. Oh, you got to register for them, but they're all free. I talk about brain gut connection. I'll get in leaky gut, immune health. This has been a big one for people looking for answers to support immune function you, with what we're dealing with right now. Uh, thyroid, this is a major one. I talk about all sorts of lab tests in this. Um, adrenal fatigue, insomnia, and diabetes. They're all, they're all uh, together. There's a connection between it, even Alzheimer's. Autoimmunity. I'd say the majority of our clients are dealing with some form of autoimmunity in our clinic, stress, hormones, and health, and weight gain, toxicity. Anyway, I'm trying to blaze through that. So there's lots there. It's all free. Take advantage of it. But this is what I wanted to talk about, the lab testing. If people are looking for answers, again, you can call us. You, you know, We can help you navigate through. We can order things for you. Um, but I get into everything here. You can order practically anything here without a doctor. It's um, pretty wild. And I did this simply, you know, I did this all for, um, for, for clients that we work with so they could monitor their own numbers and not even need us. They can just order the lab. So we teach people how to take care of themselves. We even teach people how to read their labs, depending on how fast they pick it up. These are the Cyrex tests that I talk about. Again, it's one of my favorite labs. Again, they don't pay me for anything. They probably should. <laughs> um, but I explain how to use these labs. And I think that's really important rather than just click order, you don't know what you're in for. I explain how to use them. This is the Cyrex Array 2. This is the intestinal uh, permeability test. I, you know, you watch a video when you'd want to do this test, when you wouldn't want to do this test. This is a big gluten test. You know, there's 30 some markers in this gluten test. Uh, medical community tests three or four uh, gluten test markers. And you could miss it if you only do three or four. You know, that's if someone's reacting to gluten. But again, all of these Cyrex tests are immunoglobulin tests. They are some of the best in the world. You're not going to want to just do them to do them. You're going to want to do the immunoglobulin test first. I even have it here. I even give an explanation. It is recommended that you perform a CFM immunoglobulin panel or similar prior to ordering these tests to make sure there's enough immunoglobulins for accurate, result, accurate results. So anyway, I just wanted to highlight all the stuff on the website because it's all free. And you can get a lot of benefit from it and figure things out on your own. And there's, again, websites, there, there's podcasts, there's, there's videos, there's, there's uh, the YouTube channel. I think it's kind of hidden on here, actually. Um, on the mobile site, might be a little harder to find, but right here, 
the YouTube channel. There's over 150 videos I have on there about everything and anything. So we want it to be an information source. We want people to be able to take care of themselves. Um, we want people, knowledge is power. And, and what, what has happened in our medical system, and I'm picking on the medical system, and I'll pick on the natural model too, but what has happened is, is people aren't told what to do, they're not told how to do it, and they become forever dependent. One fun, fundamental pillar in our clinic is so people can take care of themselves. Of course, they, we have to teach them, so education is a big part of what we do. If you want to learn more, you can schedule a consultation with us. It's discounted. It's regular. This year now, it was an hour. is 307. We knocked down the, cons the consultation to 97. It's 97 now. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can reach out, take advantage of that if that's something you want. Otherwise, take advantage of the website. It's all free. But hopefully, hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully that um, you were able to learn enough about when to do a food sensitivity test, when not to do a food sensitivity test, and how to prepare for it. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. So you can you know, save your resources and get an accurate result. So I guess I'm gonna close up here. If there's any questions, please email me. Um, all of our information's on the website, www.drgharrison.com. And um, yeah, next month we're gonna have another one coming out. So there's gonna be, um, there's always more information coming out. So stay tuned. Also on the website, I think you can even sign up for newsletters of when these, when these events are happening. So with that being said, I'm Dr. Glenn Harrison, and uh, thanks for joining. And hopefully I look forward to seeing you uh, where we talk about another health issue in one of our masterclasses. Have a great night.